Hello and uh, welcome to the uh, European Report. Uh, once again here in the European Parliament, which is in the heart of the European Union here in Brussels, as we discuss the EU-Israel relations in terms of the uh, labelling of Israeli produce and goods produced in Judea and Samaria, East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. Someone's saying, what impact is this having on Israeli-EU relations? And we'll also be discussing the uh, recent expected visit of the Iranian foreign minister uh, to the European Parliament and to the EU's institutions and saying, is it time that we open up and normalise relations with Iran, um, thanks to the Iran deal? So in today's programme, I'm joined by uh, Ruth Isaac, who is representing the Belgium uh, Coalition for Israel. So welcome to the programme, Ruth. And uh, Thomas Sandel, the founder and director of uh, the European Coalition for Israel, ECI. And... Um, the, sorry, is it uh, Theodora yes. uh, Koptil, who Perfect. is representing Europe, Israel, public affairs? So Thank well, you for having me. Pleasure. So welcome to the European Report. I'll, I'll start off with, uh, with, with you, Thomas, as we're discussing the um, EU guidelines, because mm -hmm. the uh, European Coalition for Israel has really had this whole issue as, uh, as, as it's one of its main campaigns to highlight the awareness and the injustice, really, of this labelling of Israeli goods and produce, which is discriminating against Israel, also hurting Israel economically and also the Palestinians as well. Where, where are we in terms of the uh, EU guidelines? Well, I, I think the good, good news is that um, uh, just a few days ago, uh, Israel and EU formally kissed and made up and uh, decided that, you know, we need to re-engage uh, again uh, what happened, of course, in November was that Israel decided to um, isolate the European Union from the peace process, basically as a result of, of the, the labeling guidelines. And uh, it took until now to normalize these, these relations. And um, the way that it happened was quite, quite interesting because it was obvious for everyone that it was in no one's interest. Uh, not in EU's interest to be sidelined from this important process, but neither in the interest of Israel. So the compromise, in a way, seemed to be that they agreed to say that uh, the labeling directive does in no way determine the final border in, uh, in, a, in a peace agreement between the Palestinians and Israel, and, and also that the EU clearly are against any attempt to, to boycott, uh, boycott Israel. And I think this was uh, as good as a compromise that one could get under these uh, circumstances. And I think we should, we should um, try to find a, a foundation to, to restart uh, good relations between EU and Israel at this point. Yeah. Uh, and Ruth, it's uh, great to have you on the programme. So I'm um, particularly, as you're here, representing uh, the uh, Belgium Coalition for Israel. Uh, can you say how, for example, here in Belgium, that the EU labelling impact has had an impact on, say, Jewish-Israeli businesses and its impact it's had here on singling out Israeli produce maybe in uh, supermarkets here in Belgium? Yeah. I, I think... Um it is um, a little bit early to assess, first of all. But secondly, the most important thing is the symbolic, if you like, um, is how people, the perception of what people thought, uh, what people, in, in many ways, most people didn't feel that economically will harm Israel, but it was very much about, um, um, some people felt that it was um, endorsing, if you like, the BDS movement, the boycott. It was very much reinforcing all the statements and all the rhetoric that was against Israel, basically. So um, we cannot assess what impact it had in terms of economic, as I said, activity. But um, we're more concerned about uh, what the younger generation um, perceived as this um, labeling to be Excellent. And um, Theodora, you, you're here representing the uh, Europe-Israel public affairs. So you, you actually, the nature of your work is still directly here with the European institutions, particularly the European Parliament uh, and MEPs. But can you describe how that uh, Europe claims to be, wants to be um, uh, an even broker in the peace negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians? But uh, it would seem, particularly with the EU labelling and the EU guidelines, that uh, what uh, the EU is doing is favouring the Palestinian position over the Israeli position. How do you think that is hurting the EU's reputation in terms of international diplomacy? Well, as you said, uh, Simon, uh, it's, 
it's everything is a matter of perception, especially when it comes to um, mediation. So if EU wants to assert its role as a mediator, they need to understand that the perception in the Israeli society is uh, is changing because the EU behavior is changing, and the change uh, it has been uh, it has been talked extensively between uh, between the Israeli government and the uh, and the EU officials. The change started more abruptly in, um, in with the council, with the foreign council. Um, Conclusions in May uh, uh, in May 2012, um, and it, it it is an incremented language, and uh, uh, that that and that ended up in, in this uh, Foreign Affairs Council resolutions in uh, uh, in February, this uh, like 15th of February, stating that all agreements from now on will apply uh, only within the 67 borders. So Israel is uh, that the EU recognizes the jurisdiction of Israel only within the 67 borders. Uh, so I would say what we heard very often from from uh, from the Israeli officials and uh, the Israeli government is that you guys have to do better. You can't hold uh, the bilateral relations uh, hostage to what whatever is happening in the peace process because in the peace process there are multiple partners. It it takes two to tango. So this is the message that has been sent repeatedly from from Jerusalem to to Brussels. Uh, it, it it so happens though that. Uh, the, the, the obsession that Brussels and the European Union has with uh, with settlements, it's it's an, it's an obsession that they have uh, dressed it up as something that addresses uh, bilateral uh, relations. And when when they published um, the guidelines, as you mentioned in uh, July 2013, they said that this has this has uh, some, this is something to do with Horizon 2020. Therefore, it's something it has something to do with uh, uh, EU bilateral relations with Israel. The same happened also with the uh, interpretative notice from 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 November. Uh, so what the what Brussels say, uh, keeps saying is that it, it has it, it's bilateral. But if it's if it's bilateral, they should they should also come to terms with the fact that. It, they, both documents they deal with settlements, and settlements they are just one of the issues of, uh, of the peace process. Therefore, every time, every time the, um, every time they they have this approach towards uh, towards the bilateral uh, uh, agreements, I think that the multilateral uh, uh, co component of it should 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 uh, be taken in account. So, uh, I was talking about the foreign affairs uh, conclusions and the, and, and the documents issued by the EAS in, in cooperation with uh, with the Commission. But we can also see here in the Parliament. We, get, we hear a lot of calls from the members of the European Parliament for a suspension of the association agreement. Uh, all these, all these activities and all these tendencies, they 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 come across in the Israeli in the Israeli public as something that is pro-Palestinian. Uh, and if EU coming to address your question, if EU wants to be perceived as a as a mediator, they need to address that that perception. So therefore, they need to engage also, put pressure also on the Palestinian side. No, absolutely. Uh, and Thomas, what do you think actually brought uh, the EU to enter into secret talks with Israel over um, really cancelling these uh, awful EU guidelines or EU labelling of Israeli products? Well, of course, they, they were not cancelling as, as much as uh, just uh, realising that they need to work together regardless of, of the guidelines. and. And of course, uh, even the conclusions are a little bit uh, contradictory as, um, as the, what, what they're trying to convey with the guidelines is basically to say that, you know, listen, this is Israel proper and these are occupied territories. And the conclusion between Netanyahu and Mogherini is to say the opposite, to say that, well, this, is, this can only be achieved through negotiations. There are no clear parameters as to what should, the fi what should be the final borders. Uh, but as I said earlier, it's, it's very clear that Europe needs Israel. I mean, Israel needs Europe, but perhaps even less so. But, but Europe really needs Israel. We need to work together. When we look at the, the terror threat that, that Europe is under, who were the first ones to come to our rescue in, in Paris to prevent uh, further bloodshed in, in Germany and, and other places in Europe? Yes, it was Israeli intelligence. And, and anyone who have just a little bit of um, uh, experience in this field, they know that we cannot be isolated from Israel and, and we, we need Israel as a partner. And um, the EU and, and I think the officials that I have been speaking, speaking with, they're very uh, outspoken about this. And um, 
it was almost when we were in the middle of the discussion about the labeling directives, if there had been a decent way to um, uh, to withdraw, they probably wouldn't have withdrawn from the from the from the guidelines. Uh, but I think that it it is a good thing that we came to this new beginning, and it's only for us to hope that uh, that um, you know we'll have a brighter future than than what has been the last few years. Yeah, uh, uh, and Ruth, sadly, when it comes down to the uh, Isra labeling is of Israeli goods and produce or um, the EU guidelines, sadly, it, it it brings up in the public imagination the old boycotts against uh, Israel in Germany and the uh, whole sanctions that Israel is facing. Now, surely this is something that Europe wants to be free of That's from right. that association with the past, particularly how the Jewish people then feel singled out, and particularly knowing that these uh, labelling also has a direct impact on Palestinian workers who, as well who are earning a good income. Um, how, how do you perceive the EU guidelines? Um, as I said earlier, it is very much about perception. Uh, maybe legally, um, as uh, Thomas mentioned earlier, legally maybe it is what it is. Um, just a clarification, some would say, or um, that it doesn't really have any impact as such. But it is very much about perception, is how people in Israel and here in Europe, how they perceive it, people who are anti-Israel, those who support BDS, uh, they, for sure, they think that this is a victory for, us, for them. So, um, and the fact that um, it seems like it is only Israel that um, the European Union felt appropriate to make such uh, guidelines, you cannot deny that it is, a, it is a singling out, you know. Going back to the Jewish um, shops and businesses being boycotted back, you know, before the Second World War, um, I think it is legitimate to say that you can draw some parallels. Uh, without wanting to be very negative, you know. Um, unfortunately, um, people will, will feel that the whole world is against them. They will feel that um, they've been pointed or they've been brushed in a certain negative way. And, you know, this is actually the, the opposite thing that it should happen. And what's the best way to counter the uh, the EU labelling? Uh, I know that uh, Jewish communities in Britain, I know throughout Europe as well, are encouraging people to buy Israeli produce. Is this the best way to counter the uh, EU labelling of Israeli produce? So. The, the initiative to invest rather than divest in the Israeli products, I think it's a very good initiative. And uh, everyone who has uh, Israel uh, best uh, interest at, at, at their heart, they, they should do it. However, I think, as, I, as, as it was mentioned earlier uh, around the table, it, it's just a symptom of, of, of the EU approach towards, towards the conflict. So, uh, yes, we should invest more. We should... Uh, uh, we, we should um, push for a, a, a stronger uh, cooperation between uh, Israel uh, and the European Union in terms of uh, uh, security, uh, uh, cyber security and, and uh, security cooperation and all, all the rest. But uh, there, there should be more. There, uh, if, if EU wants to play uh, the role of the mediator that, uh, that you were pointing earlier, Simon, I think that they should put some pressure also on the, on the Palestinians. Uh, there, was a, there was a very interesting um, uh, debate in the parliament a couple of weeks ago. Um, the socialist group hosted uh, the Palestinian ambassador at, at large, um, Harvard graduate, very articulate, um, and his main claim was, was the following. We, uh, the EU should help us make uh, the occupation so expensive that they will withdraw. However, everything that it's uh, Palestinian reconciliation and everything that's it, internal affairs, it's, it's our business. And I think that speaks a lot to the double standard that Israel is submitted uh, and the Palestinians are not. Because every time uh, there's an initiative in Israel that uh, comes close to, uh, uh, to that, that comes close to the perception of uh, hum, human rights being uh, 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 breached or something like that, that there's a whole, uh, there's a whole. Uh, uh, uproar uh, here in the parliament and in, in the institutions. But when it comes to the Palestinians, everyone closes an eye because they feel that it's mine territory and they, they don't have the tools with, with what to go inside and fix it. So, yes, BDS, we should invest more in the Israeli products, but Europeans, as, and starting with the European citizen and uh, with the public officials and with the decision makers, they, they should take their role 
more seriously and say, okay, if we want to be, if we if we want to have a stake at, in in this uh, in this mediation, then we need to be uh, we need to be balanced and uh, uh, get involved also in the in the Palestinian reconciliation because building a Palestinian society that is ready to sign a peace agreement is as important as uh, uh, counting the the settlements. Uh, and Thomas, the final words on this subject, I go to you, but haven't uh, Mogherini and uh, the European Union learnt the hard way that it's actually Israel controls the facts on the ground? So the fact is that um, Bibi Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, refused the Israeli Foreign Ministry to work with the European Commission on various projects has resulted in the uh, European Commission having to uh, really come to the table to renegotiate the uh, EU labelling. Yeah, it, it is a bit of a poker game, of course, you know, who will blink first, because, as I said, we, we need each other. It works both ways. And, and obviously, it's uh, vital for, for Israel to have good trade relations with Israel. That's nothing that they can jeopardize under any circumstances. And um, um, looking, looking at the bigger, bigger picture, of course, with... Uh, with, uh, with the war in Syria, with uh, the, the, the tension with, with Russia and, and everything that is changing it with that regards. Of course, Israel and, and the Western world, not only the EU, they need to work together. And, and, I, and, and I'm pretty sure, you know, everyone here also understood it was only a matter of time before they would come to this conclusion. And, and, and maybe it was a good learning experience for both sides to see that uh, isolation is not the answer to this this uh, huge challenge that we are facing, but uh, you know even stronger Israeli European cooperation is the only way forward. Absolutely. So the next topic of uh, discussion really that we're going to be discussing is um, how that uh, Iran's foreign minister is an official state visit to the European Union. So we're asking, should we normalize relations with Iran? And now I'm going to ask you firstly, Ruth, should the European Union be hosting the Iranian foreign minister? I know previously last month they hosted the Iranian president, uh, Rouhani. Um, because of the Iran deal and because of the Iran deal, do you feel that uh, Europe should open up its, uh, the uh, sorry, should actually have the welcome carpet for the uh, Iranian foreign minister and president and uh, have they changed as a regime? Um, for sure they have not changed and I don't think they, they actually promised to change. Um, that's the only thing that is, is for sure. Um, now. Again, I would say that it's a matter of perceptions because uh, the meeting will take place. Um, I, don't, I personally don't think that many things will change. Uh, it is just a matter of uh, perception, what people will think, both Europeans and Iranians. Um, I personally feel that it is a good thing in the sense of uh, Iran being open. Iran not being, not Iran as the regime, because I don't expect them to change, as I said, um, but in terms of the people and maybe the younger people and for them not to feel as isolated. But um, I, I also feel and I hope that uh, pressure will continue to be upon the regime to change, that uh, Europe should send a very strong and clear message against the human rights record that they have. Um, I think it is unacceptable for human beings to be killed today, um, in, sometimes in a very barbaric way, undemocratic way for sure, and um, for Europe to keep silent. Whilst, I mean, going back to Israel, you see the double standards there. You know, Israel being scrutinized in so many ways, where Iran, it seems like we're just opening a door of friendship. If that, that's the way that I think a lot of people will perceive it. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and Thomas, how much do you think this is all being driven by um, commercial considerations? Uh, for example, the opening up of Iran's energy markets to European companies to divest in uh, and obviously then to maximise profits. How much is this being driven by economic concerns rather than actually looking at the nature of the regime itself? I think, I think it's very clear that this is the driving force. And as we've been saying in these programmes over the last few years, that uh, uh, Choosing another path, you know, I, I think even in Germany, someone could put a number and say, well, how many jobs would we lose if we uh, isolated Iran completely and, and there would be no trade relations with Iran? Um, and, and I think we, we are in a situation in the world today when few governments and few citizens are willing to sacrifice anything. 
of, of uh, comfort, of uh, financial gain, in order for believing in, in a greater good. So believing in a principle, being the dignity of, of um, life in, in Iran, respect for human rights. Once it comes down to this, you know, will we'll, um, we'll I have a job next week in, in, the, in the industry where I'm involved and where I know that Iran could be a, a potential trade partner? You know, the decision often is, is, very, is very, you know, rationally uh, calculated. Um, so, so, of course, this is driven by, by business interest, by, by um, um, but I think also naivety. It's, it's not only the, the fact that, you know, this will give um, European eco economy a boost. I think there's clearly a naivety. Uh, and I would, I would come back remembering I've spoken with old Germans. There's one in particular who said, my father, he was an industrialist, he read Hitler's Mein Kampf in the late 30s. And he said, well, I read what he was saying. I believed him. And, and, and I drew the, the, the conclusions and I, I had to leave Germany. Uh, and of course, Hitler at that time, he was, uh, he was a miserable, uh, you know, second rank officer in the, in the German, German um, uh, army and there was no reason to take him seriously. But I mean, when, when a leader of a UN member state is saying, cons sending out a consistent message in the UN General Assembly year after year that, that um, the Jewish state is a state that needs to be annihilated, you know, we can't say that we never heard him or, or that he was just joking. This is a consistent message. It hasn't changed even after the nuclear deal. And I think, you know, as moral um, individuals, we just have to take note. And, and it, it has, there has to be a consequence in the international community uh, of uh, using this type of language and uh, knowing that, that he means and they mean business. Yeah. Uh, and Theodora, is it time that the European Union um, really open up full economic and uh, diplomatic mm -hmm. and political relations with Iran, or do you, or do you, on the whole issue of the Iranian nuclear deal, um, because of the West, the European Union, believe that they got a special deal with Iran that they're no longer going to go and produce nuclear weapons. But surely there are other issues before we actually reach normalisation, such as their horrendous abuse of human rights, their sponsorship for international terrorism, and sport, uh, in, as well as supporting genocidal terrorist organisations like Hamas and Hezbollah, and also their shocking human rights abuses. In 2015, there were 1,000 and something executions. I don't remember exactly the number. It was doubled than in uh, than in the previous year in 2014. Only in the month of uh, of, of uh, January, uh, there were a number of 58 executions. Now, is it time for the EU to um, close an eye and? Uh, as uh, Thomas was arguing, and uh, sh uh, shake the, the hand with, uh, I'm not going to say the devil, but shake the hand with someone who has this kind of behavior. Uh, I think I would take it as a rhetorical question. And no, I don't think that the, um, uh, the, the approachment, the approachment with uh, Iran should be uh, a one deal. Uh, I think it should be something that uh, it's, uh, um, it, it's benchmarked on, on specific progress. And I think human rights should be included in, the, in that progress, not just uh, nuclear, uh, the dismantle, dismantlement of the nuclear capabilities, but also uh, how, they, how they see human rights. Uh, going back to what, uh, also just a quick observation on what Thomas was saying, uh, just last year, uh, the Ayatollah published a book, uh, How to Destroy the State of Israel. Uh, it's the same rhetoric, nothing changed. Uh, and I think it's naive just to embrace them, just to welcome them, uh, like uh, a, a good uh, a good group uh, uh, with reputation here in Brussels has has done it uh, uh, last night. Just to welcome them with uh, our arms open. I don't think it's the right approach, and uh, it shouldn't be like that. It should be a realistic. Uh... So can, can I just come back to this and and just look at some very basic principles in international community? Uh, in order to be a member of United Nations, it says in the preamble that you have to show that you want to live in peace with, with all your neighbors, with all members of, um, of the United Nations. Uh, and I think 
you know, for most part, this is always the case. You know, Germany does not have on its agenda to uh, annihilate France, or you know, Finland does not have a particular country that we hate and, and want to get rid of. But but in the case of Iran, they're clearly in breach with the most basic principles of um, of international relations, and this should be pointed out, and they should be made accountable. Uh, and, and I think everything else is just a big uh, delusion from, from our part. I just want to thank you all for uh, joining me on today's uh, European report. Uh, thank you for this discussion. And I just want to thank you for watching this particular programme. And uh, really, the way, best way we can counter the EU labelling or the EU guidelines is to buy is more Israeli goods and more Israeli produce. And in terms of uh, EU opening up its... Uh, relations with Iran, I think we have to be very vigilant. We have to really check to see if the regime has actually changed and uh, has a better human rights record and also then wants to actually prevent its development of nuclear weapons altogether before we can welcome Iran back into the family of nations. So thank you for watching today's uh, European report.